Okay. This is a four part webinar series that's hosted by the North Texas Municipal Water District in uh, participation with Texan by Nature. Today's topic is spring into conservation. Um, before we get rolling and I introduce the speakers, just a quick overview of today's program and, and, the and who the district is and, and what the, this webinar series is about. Um, again, today's topic is spring into conservation. The, the program in this webinar series is a, a partnership between the district and Texan by Nature. It's a free four part webinar series. Uh, and the goal is to increase education and awareness uh, regarding water conservation practices throughout Texas and to provide new data, ideas, actionable next steps, um, and resources for individuals and businesses to get involved and to promote conservation, uh, be that at your home, business, or within your service area. Um, so we're very excited. We've got a great lineup of speakers here today. Um, again, my name is Galen Roberts. I'm, I'm with North Texas Municipal Water District. A bit about the district, we are a regional wholesale provider. Uh, we provide water service to approximately 2 million people in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex area. And conservation is a very critical part of our efforts to manage um, our water supplies and water resources, but also a major component of our of water planning as we look to the future and, and growing demands and population uh, moving forward. And in conservation, its importance is not unique just to us. This is a hot topic throughout the state and a very important issue. So we're very excited again to bring this webinar um, here today and to, to discuss it further. One housekeeping item before I introduce the speakers and we get going, we will be monitoring the chat for questions. Uh, we do encourage you to enter questions for the speakers into that chat box. We've got a lot to cover today, so we are going to try to save the Q&A portion for the end of the presentation. Um, but please do enter your questions in there. We, we hope to address as many as we can uh, at the end of the program. And with that, I will introduce our four panelists. So speaking first today is Randall Rush. He's a senior policy advisor for agriculture with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Region 6 office. His topic will be storm and drought resilience. Next, we have Dr. Christy Seegers. She's an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. Uh, her topic will be turf grass during the seasons. We also have Ms. Linda Dunn from the John Bunker Sands Wetlands Center. And she'll be talking on the role of the wetlands and spring wildlife. We have Ms. Kim Conroe. She's the past president for the Native Plant Society of Texas. And she'll be talking about native and adaptive landscaping and their benefits for conservation. So Randall, you're, you're up first. I'll ask that you share your screen if you're able. Sure, Galen. Um, let's see here. Okay. Everyone can see it? All right. Uh, Randall Rush, EPA office in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I also do, I've been working on the uh, EPA's climate adaptation planning efforts. Uh, so I'm gonna cover drought, <clears throat> excuse me, some drought issues and talk about um, ways we can uh, mitigate drought through uh, green infrastructure planning efforts. So uh, jumping into it, there are several different types of droughts, if you will. Certainly there's a meteorological uh, drought effects. That's where we're having um, dry weather patterns for a long time. Hydrologic drought, um, it's where our water supplies are low. And uh, agriculture drought, where even though uh, we might have a high water supply, uh, certainly the farmers in our area are more rain dependent on for their crops versus irrigation as in other parts of the country. And then that could lead to a socioeconomic drought uh, where our food supply or supply and demand of different products are um, affected by uh, meteorological drought. And then of course, ecological drought is when um, the balance through the ecosystems, and I like to say echo because whatever we do bounces back to us like an echo. So instead of eco, I call it echo. Ecosystems, um, are impacted by, by the drought. 
Um, certainly here is the most current drought map. As you can see, uh, NOAA puts this together. There's also a, a national uh, drought resiliency partnership. EPA is a member of that as well. Um, every week this map is updated by NOAA. And as you can see, the states in our regional area, uh, Texas um, is pretty much 90% in some form of drought, whether it's, the, whether it's abnormally dry in some areas or like in our area, it seems to be an extreme drought up here in North Texas. And then we have exceptional droughts up near the Panhandle areas and, and far West Texas. So we are in a drought pattern. Droughts are hard to predict hard to predict when they end, uh, but certainly we are in a pattern right now. Um, looking through EPA resources on droughts, um, a lot of our programs cover or touch upon droughts, whether it's through our, our natural disaster planning efforts, our water sense program and such. Also, um, now that we're allowed to work on climate adaptation, again, we'll be integrating um, drought as a mitigating force in our, in our climate adaptation planning efforts. And certainly um, one of those efforts is the state revolving fund program. We at the agency uh, manage that we pass on to the state agencies. In this ca case, it would be Texas Water Development Board. And uh, through the, the fundings of these state revolving funds for drinking water, um, facility upgrades or, or development of facilities or or uh, sewage treatment plants, um, drought mitigation, and, and green infrastructure development as an allowable cost under these loan funds. Um, in fact, uh, part of EPA's drought and resiliency planning efforts also has a checklist that we make available to local governments and the state agencies as, as, a, as a planning uh, effort uh, or allow the states to to utilize in their planning efforts to mitigate drought. And I have the link there for that. And in fact, I think all of these presentations will be available later so you can utilize these links later. Uh, each state in our region, and we cover the five regions in the South Central US, have a some form of a drought contingency plan, also conservation efforts in each of our states. Um, I share that with you just in case you wanna look up those resources. Uh, Texas, for instance, has their drought um, contingency plan. There's a link for that. And in fact, uh, there is a new law in that um, TCQ is to, um, to request that um, state uh, municipalities be able to access and develop potable um, or reuse, reuse water for, for purposes and in, in, in such. So now, one of the better ways to address or what little water we do capture is, 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 is designing green infrastructure in our programs. And that's promoting uh, best practices that will help capture what stormwater we do get. And so that it's uh, made available for later use. Um, it's one of our better uh, resiliency uh, aspects, uh, FEMA for instance, has put together quite a nice document that just recently came out. And, and in this document, they talk about more nature-based solutions versus man-made solutions to address uh, drought and other hazards. Um, of course, they talk about it in uh, three different main aspects, whether it's a watershed large scale. And when I talk about watersheds or landscape, I'm talking you know, basin wide type planning efforts could be, you know, 100 square miles. I, I recall working with uh, Mr. Roberts on the Lake Levon watershed based plan a few years ago, and that was turned out to be quite a nice plan. Also in their document, they talk about the neighborhood or site scale, even down to the homeowner size. And I'll get into examples of some um, green infrastructure type projects you can do at the homeowner level size. And and it being a, a hazards document and because of sea level rise, they also do cover coastal areas. And I took a screenshot of one page from the document where they talk about the importance of various aspects along the she, uh, seashore, including coastal wetlands. And we'll have a speaker later today that talks about the benefits of wetlands. 
Uh, EPA has a document that um, is pretty useful for municipalities. It's, uh, we always are promoting our partners, whether it's the state agency or our city partners, planning groups, uh, to look for opportunities to uh, implement what, a, what we refer to as LID, which is low impact development, or GI, which is green infrastructure. Uh, certainly, uh, we encourage cities, certainly when they're doing upgrades, let's say sidewalk repair or resurfacing of streets and such, um, to look at ways to uh, redesign those in ways that could help combat climate change, also capture stormwater runoff for better use. Uh, here's some examples of those, more of a, a citywide scale, where you, um, <clears throat> instead of having the stormwater just run off the street and down a storm drain through a pipe to our close, closest creek, um, because of all the concrete and stuff that adds to the volume of water and runoff over time, especially as our cities in the Metroplex start growing further and bigger and more sidewalk and hardened surface, there's little chance for that rainwater to percolate down. So um, it actually harms our creeks because then we start more, uh, more volume of water and those creeks start eroding them and they start eroding their path and, and there's possible property damage and, and increase of floods really. Uh, so different ways to capture the stormwater runoff, whether it be small, you know, designs of rain gardens and such that kind of capture the, the rainwater instead of going off site to the creek is captured in the ground. In fact, in, even in my yard, I've developed some um, little rain gardens where I capture it instead of it having runoff on the street or the use of per permeable pavement where, yeah, the stone itself is not absorbing the water, but the 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 concrete in between is able to absorb the storm water and, and capture it into the ground. Um, other examples of G, uh, green infrastructure being green roofs and the benefit of those, they provide a habitat, also urban heat island effect, uh, as certainly as if you commute from uh, your downtown source out to your maybe suburb home, there's five to six degree difference. And so we have these urban heat island effects and promoting green roofs and more trees and areas. Homeowners can also install uh, rain barrels to trap the uh, rainwater from the roofs and use that water later. Uh, we have uh, partnered with the city of Albuquerque, for instance, and in they developing a green infrastructure uh, strategy. And here's a schematic of that, along with, um, some green roof installations that they have done in the city of Albuquerque, which did provide a, a butterfly habitat. And also, you know, every little bit helps when you're trying to combat um, urban heat. heat. Um, in years past, uh, this finished up a few years ago, we worked with uh, the Lower Rio Grande Valley uh, Stormwater Network and TCEQ in where they redeveloped uh, a parking lot at South Texas College and did some stormwater um, improvements where the, the parking lot was improved to where the rainwater would be captured there. And then the students at South Texas College were, um, were there to monitor that. And um, Denton County has been working with the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA in utilizing some funds for increased. I know Denton, Denton County has done a lot of work and the city of Denton has done a lot of work on promoting green infrastructure in, in their city limits. And I gain ahead. Here's some additional resources. I don't wanna take all the time from the other speakers, but their additional resilience uh, uh, resources we all can use. Um, again, we came out during the Trump administration with a national water reuse action plan. One of those products just came out last week, which is a multi reuse program of stormwater. And uh, there's also an equity guide because we do need to keep in mind sometimes when we make these improvements of green infrastructure in parts of our cities, that adds to the property value, which is great. But also then maybe if it was in a lower income area, there could be this gentrification where, where, those in, where the property value is so high, some of those residents, residents have to move on. So equity is another thing we need to keep in mind. And I'm just going to make a pitch. EPA is coming out with this climate adaptation plan. Here's the link for it. We're supposed to have some public uh, sessions in the coming month. So I just want to make you alert, uh, aware of that, because drought 
even though that's my topic, drought is tied to climate change. And I'm running out of time, so I'll just go that. Our new bipartisan infrastructure bill is giving billions of dollars back to what I mentioned earlier, the state revolving fund programs to the states. Again, green infrastructure is, is one of those aspects. Um, so in this case, Texas Water Development Board is the lead state agency, but we're passing on EPA funds through this bipartisan infrastructure law that passed onto uh, the funds will go to Texas Water Development Board. And this would be my final page because I know this is gonna be saved. Here's a list of the links and additional information for you guys to look at later. And I will stop there. Thank you, Randall. A good presentation. I will just say, I, I think the foundation you've laid here in talking about drought and, and how people define drought based on, on their situation and, and their use for water is gonna be important as we transition to the next speakers and their topics, um, as well as potential impacts from climate change in the future and, and impact on drought duration and severity for, for the state. So I think it's a great segue into our next speaker, um, Dr. Chrissy Seegers, who's gonna talk a bit about turf grass during the seasons. Dr. Seegers. All right, uh, thank you. Um, so turf grass is always a hot topic in the spring, really all year round. And so we wanted to go through some, just some thoughts of what we should be thinking about during this time of the year. And then I'll be available for any questions at the end. So I want you to think to yourself, turf grass areas, what is your goal? We want to create not only a beautiful turf grass area, if that's our choice, we want to create a practical area. So we want to make sure we know why we have that grass there and that the grass is in the right spot, right? Now, plant selection is a big thing. We don't have time to talk about a lot of that today, but do you believe that a water conserving landscape can contain turf grass? A lot of people don't. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the things we can think about whenever we are managing turf grass and how that can play on water. Because we just heard from Randall, we're in a drought, right? And so, you know, now this time of the year that's coming up, we hope we are going to start getting more rainfall, of course, but we are in a drought um, in most of our state. And so, you know, thinking about how that could potentially impact our turf grass areas or our plants is very important. So when we think about successful turf grass management, the number one thing we need to do is make sure we're choosing the, the correct plant for the correct place. Um, turf grass is not the answer in all situations and we know that. So we are not gonna promote for you to put turf grass in certain areas when they're not gonna grow well there. So what I want you to look at here is I like to look at successful turf grass management as a ladder system. We've got to do those bottom rungs correctly before we can have an impact on how that grass looks and the pest that that grass can potentially um, have harm it. So number one, proper establishment, but look at our next four rungs. These are our four basic cultural practices that we should be doing for successful turf grass management. And how we do those is very subjective. I might not do those the same way that you are going to do those in your yard, but learning how we can use those practices to work together can promote a very healthy turf grass um, area with really large impacts on weed control, disease control, and insect control, things that really um, could harm our grass. So basic, basic, basic mowing, um, basic cultural practice. If you don't irrigate, if you don't fertilize, if you don't do any aerification, everyone is going to mow. And so even something as simple as cranking up your lawnmower can have a really large impact on how our grass looks and how our grass can effectively take up water as well. So 
most commonly we see that folks don't mow enough. So they'll get into the practice where we want our grass to look a certain way. Okay, great. But are you able to manage it? Are you, do you have the management capabilities or desire? So think about your mowing height, raising your mowing height during uh, stressful situations, during drought situations is going to promote deeper rooting. Mowing height is directly correlated to the rooting depth. Now, that rooting depth is also dependent on is your soil conducive for roots to grow in, right? And so that's where we bring in some of that other cultural management. So I want you to think about your mowing height. You know, do you have Bermuda grass? Do you have St. Augustine grass? Do you have Zoysia grass? What type of mowing height do you desire? And are you capable of, uh, of doing that? Irrigation. This, these are just some thoughts. It's not uncommon for water to be the driving force of our turf grass issues. That can be from underwatering to overwatering. And so, you know, thinking about your, your irrigation practices, okay, I have an irrigation system. We hope that it's not looking like the one in this photo, right? So if we have an irrigation system, we need to make sure we can effectively run it. So we're going to talk a little bit later about the Water My Yard program, but this is the time of year where you should be doing some checkups, right? So if you have an irrigation system, you know, doing some auditing, doing some repairs, doing some potential updates, um, having a plan for running your irrigation system in the future. So I'm curious, think to yourself, how many of you think we should be irrigating right now here in North Texas? Should we be irrigating our turf grass areas right now in North Texas? What do you think? I'm hoping that you're thinking no. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, I live in a um, neighborhood that likes to overwater. Every day I walk my dog and there's runoff in the street. And so, you know, now is not the time for you to be running your irrigation for turf grass reasons. So even the Water My Yard program, I checked this, this Sunday, I got an email from Water My Yard. It said zero inches required this week. We got one and a half inches of effective rainfall last week. That's pretty good one and a half inches of effective rainfall, which means you can actually use that rainfall. It's not running off. So now's the great time for you to plan, for you to schedule, um, you know, learn about the Water My Yard program, learn how it can help you. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So irrigation checkup is now. Running your irrigation for turf grass reasons is not now, okay? So just be mindful of that. Another big part of turf grass management is I get a ton of calls from homeowners about weed control. What can I do to kill these weeds in my yard? Now, there's a lot of things you can do. A lot of it is really based on those cultural practices, irrigating correctly, mowing correctly, watering correctly, fertilizing correctly. That can have about a 70% impact on your weed control. Now, we know that some of them are, you're going to have to rely on chemicals if that's where you want to go, right? So this is the time of year where we start seeing those nasty winter weeds popping up everywhere. It's prime time. Um, so you see the seed heads, you see the flowering structures. Do you think it's prime time to control those with a chemical right now? I'm hope you're, hoping you're thinking no. <laughs> um, whenever we start seeing those big weeds, that's when we start saying, oh man, I see them now, right? Now this is the time where I want to go out and control them. Once a weed gets mature, once we have a seed head on a grassy weed, once we have a flowering structure on a broadleaf weed, it's going to be much tougher for you to get rid of that weed uh, the larger it is and the more mature it is. So what we want you to think about is 
timing. Now, this is just a general guide. So when, when we're looking at our most popular summer weeds, crabgrass, goosegrass, those weeds are going to begin if they, if, if they haven't already germinating, okay? So whenever we want to develop a weed control program in the spring or the fall, we want to think pre-emergent pre-emergent that's before the weed has had a chance to come up okay now these are the soil temperatures that are conducive for those weeds to germinate and begin their emergent cycle so we want to be proactive if we are concerned with weeds not reactive so we would like to create a program to control them before they come up. We don't have a lot of time to go into that today, but please, um, you know, if you if you need help, contact me. Um, running out of time, so I want to make sure I get to some some things. But these are some disease watches that are are starting to come. Um, if you have Bermuda grass and it's cool, it's wet, it's cloudy, which it commonly is in the fall and the spring. Watch out for bipolaris leaf spot. This can be sometimes mowed out of pretty easily, but if it gets too severe, you might need a fungicide. St. Augustine, ryegrass, very conducive for gray leaf spot. Once we get those temperatures between 70, 95 degrees, we have at least nine hours of continuous leaf wetness, we will start getting gray leaf spot. So that's why it's important when we start watering to water early in the morning so that we knock the dew off and our leaves have time for that water to get off of them. We don't want to promote evening watering because we could easily have nine plus hours of leaf wetness there. Now that our grass is becoming, um, it's coming out of dormancy, right? And so the dreaded take all root rot is starting to show. Um, it's commonly seen once grasses start coming out of dormancy. Now it can be seen all year long, but you know, this is a root disease. This is a very, very common disease in North Texas because of our soils. We have very high pH and we have very heavy soils very common. So this is something to, to start looking out for. And if you have any questions about how to control that, um, we have some fact sheets online for that. Um, I want to tell you all about a new St. Augustine grass that we are just releasing from a and It's called Cobalt. Cobalt St. Augustine grass currently, based on our data from across the U.S., it will use 60 to 80% less water than any commercial standard St. Augustine grass. So like Raleigh, Palmetto, Floritam, this grass requires 60 to 80% less water. What does that mean? Down in College Station, we had this down there a couple years ago. We turned the water off. And we said, how many days do we need to, or how much do we need to water this to keep it green? So actually to keep this grass green and growing, now I'll have to get the specifics on that. Um, we only had to water it once every two weeks, okay? So that was a deep, infrequent watering once every two weeks in the heat of the summer. Now that's a little bit different environment, of course, but, you know, it's showing some good uh, drought tolerance. Okay, so this is one of those St. Augustine grasses that we're no longer going to be able to call a water hog. Now, when will this be available? To the general public, you will likely be able to get it in wide um, availability in 2024. So that gives you a little bit of time, two years, to plan. Do I want to change? Do I want to incorporate some turf grass into my yard? And so this is one where you can, can do that, okay? In my last slide, we are getting ready to do some work with the North Texas municipality through the Water My Yard irrigation schedule. So if you're not familiar with Water My Yard, I would definitely recommend you checking it out. But what we wanna do is we wanna check and make sure the recommendations are still valid. So right now, the email that you would get from Water My Yard is um, how much you should water based on a stress factor. 
Right now, our stress factor is 60%. We want to look at an 80% stress factor, 60%, 50%, 40%. That's based on how much water was lost through evapotranspiration. That's the email you'll be getting weekly from Water My Yard. So we want to check and make sure it's still valid. Can we reduce that? Can we make the stress factor a little bit greater and still get the same results? Okay, so that's going to be um, happening this summer in Dallas. And that will be great because once we get that to that standpoint of having that trial available, we can let folks come out and, and view it. Okay, so I know I took a little bit more time than I should have, but I will be available for questions at the end. And please do submit your questions in the, in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Seegers. Very, very interesting. Really resonated. Um, you know, proper management requires just that management, active management, and found it really interesting. A lot of the management practices you were talking about also had some relevance in terms of water quality. Um, I know Randall hit on some of that in his presentation when talking about green infrastructure. So it's a good, good tie in. So next up, we have Miss Linda Dunn from the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center. And Linda, you want to take it away? All right, thank you. Um, well, I'm Linda Dunn. I'm with the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center, and we are a wetland center located in the center of uh, the 2,000 acre constructed wetland that the North Texas Municipal Water District built. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that actually works and which North Texas cities uh, receive water from the wetland. I want to give you a little bit of a background information. You can see some pictures here uh, of our center. So we're an education center. We do school programming for through 12th grade and we are open to the public and I will be um, getting you some um, information as far as when we're open um, near the end. Okay. My there we go. Um, as far as where we're located, um, we are located 23 miles southeast of downtown, both the, the wetland center and the north, uh, the East Fork Water Project. A lot of people think we're really far away, but in terms of if you live in the DFW area, 23 miles really isn't all that far. Um, I think we're used to traveling further than that. So um, hopefully you'll come out and visit and just visit the wetland and see how it actually works. It's an amazing um, project when you come out to, to see us. So we have two partners here, uh, the North Texas Municipal Water District, obviously. They constructed the wetland back in uh, 2006 was the beginning. Um, it went online in 2009. Uh, the Rosal Corporation is the other uh, partner that we have, both great partners. John Bunker Sands, our namesake, actually was the CEO of the Rosal Corporation. Uh, he unfortunately passed away in 2003, and I want to give a little bit of background on him and his conservation view because we carry that view forward um, here at the, at the Wetland Center itself, and then also North Texas obviously has a great conservation view, and it just extends John Bunker's past. And so John Bunker Sands, as I mentioned, he passed away in 2003. However, he was someone who really had a mind for conservation, water conservation, just conservation of land. Uh, he received a lot of awards um, in his lifetime. He was only 53 when he passed, so he was really young. But at the, at the time when the North Texas Municipal Water District approached the family, it was a cattle ranch. And John Bunker managed that cattle ranch and built a lot of wetlands himself because it was a flooding issue. You can see kind of in the, some of the pictures there in the background, a little bit flooded area before the wetland itself was built. And John Bunker had vision to build a wetland. And I'm gonna show you this picture right here because it's gonna go really well with another picture I'll put up here in just a moment. But this was his wetland and he had plans to build that wetland. And you can see down at the bottom here, um, his, uh, hang on a minute. Uh, his uh, um, statement of saying he wanted to take treated water from the East Fork of the Trinity. And you'll see that over here on the far right. Um, and his plan was to breach a levee, pull water into the wetland and filter it through plants. That's the whole point, right? Wetlands are an amazing, amazing filtering piece. And so he wanted to do that. And then he wanted to allow that water to go out into the East Fork of the Trinity cleaner, enhancing the uh, water quality in the East Fork of the Trinity. And he was going to build a wetland mitigation um, bank. So those, as you can see, a possibility of treated wastewater to be used. 
and he was going to make inventor, environmental polluters pay for their environmental crimes. So he had a foresight to think of this. Being a private citizen, he was unable to breach the levy up here. So pretty much he had to put his plans on hold. And this picture here is from 1992. He was working with a biologist. In fact, Loretta Mokri, I think, is one of the participants here. So she had the opportunity to work with John Bunker um, and getting his plans together, getting um, aerials of the property and making sure everything was set in order for his project to move forward. But as I mentioned, he just had to put his plans on the shelf. So we fast forward to 2006. I'm going to show you this picture here. Um, you can see the wetland that was built. We'll go into more detail about the wetland here in a second, but you can see that the, um, this is 175 right here. You'll see this area here, here, and then here's our central section right here. So John Bunker set the stage for this wetland to be built when the North Texas Municipal Water District approached the family to purchase land because they had to have a huge piece of land. And that wasn't very common, if you will, to have 2,000 acres or close to 2,000 acres of land to purchase in the DFW area in 2006. And so when they approached the family um, and they were working with the same company that uh, John Bunker had worked with, they were made aware of that he already had plans. And so as you can see, uh, they used his plans to set the stage to build a larger wetland. So we want to make sure that, that John Bunker, he's our namesake of our building, and he was definitely a forethinker of conservation efforts in um, bringing uh, water this way um, to people and to wildlife as well. So here's kind of the overall project here. This is Lake Levon up here. And this is the North Texas area that they provide water to. It actually extends down here into Mesquite. Um, Combine is what they call a sister city. It gets water. Um, Crandall, Forney. So all these areas around here is where water from Lake Levon will eventually end up in the municipal water. So what happens is when they were looking for land, uh, they built their wetland south of their wastewater treatment plants. And that's what these yellow excuse me, orange triangles are. So here are their wastewater treatment plants. I'm gonna use Mesquite here as an example. So when someone who lives along South Mesquite Creek here, um, when they use their water, it goes to this wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plant then takes out anything that would be in the environment that would be harmful to the environment. And then they allow the wastewater, the effluent to travel down the creek into the east fork of the wetland here. A main stem of the Trinity is over here. This is the East Fork. That is the main uh, river that will receive the effluent. And the same up here too, Muddy Creek. A lot of people ask, well, do we get water from Lake Ray Hubbard? And the answer is, is uh, yes and no. Uh, so when they allow effluent to come into Muddy Creek this way or from Rowlett Creek this way, Lake Ray Hubbard has to allow a certain percentage of that water to flow into the East Fork of the wetland. Um, because North Texas Municipal Water District has the right to that water. So we're, there's actually water coming from these creeks here and then also from Lake or Hubbard via these creeks up here. So at one time when the wetland wasn't here, this water would flow down the East Fork and eventually join up with the main stem of the Trinity. And then that water would flow all the way down to the Gulf. So what basically happens now is, here's that larger picture again, Here's your East Fork of the Trinity up here. So basically what happens is if you drive down 175, you'll see this intake structure here. They pull the water into this very Southern piece of the wetland into these are large pond sedimentation basins and they will hold the water for a day or so to allow sediment to fall out. And then the water begins its journey through the entire wetland. It takes about seven to 10 days for that water to filter all the way through. Plants are planted throughout the entire wetland. There's, I believe, 23 or so native Texas plants that are used to filter out. That process is called phytoremediation, or basically plants restoring balance to the water that's there. They're taking out the phosphates and the nitrates that come from the homes. Um, a lot of the nitrates in the East Fork aren't necessarily from fertilizers. They really are from 
the people using the water. So they're filtering out the soaps from homes and then filtering out just our waste, the nitrates. So as that travels through the wetland, it ends up here at the very bottom after that seven to 10 days. And this water is what we call polished water. It's not perfect for us to drink. I always tell the students, however, if this was someone coming from a country where they had to go and collect their water a mile away, this would be probably the cleanest water and their systems could probably handle it. But we're just blessed to live in a, in a country where we have that kind of water um, that is very, very um, clean for us. So there's a structure down here and that is the conveyance pump station number 10 and 11 there. And inside there, there are three, actually five, uh, uh, 3,000 horsepower engines, which then take this water, and I'm gonna flip back up to this slide here. This yellow line is the pipeline that goes back to Lake Levon. So at one, if, if, when, the, when everything is online and when Lake Levon needs water, North Texas has the ability to pump up to 90 to 95 million gallons of water a day back up to Lake Levon. So this water then blends with the water in Lake Levon, actually increasing the health there because around here, this is where you're gonna get you more of your runoff, right? Um, where you have your pollutants and stuff which will go straight into the, into the lake. Well here, there isn't, it's just the river there. So it's able to go up there and then the whole process starts again. Wiley, it goes to the wastewater, to the water treatment plant, excuse me. Um, gets uh, treated for drinking water, goes out to all of the cities, people use it, goes back to the wastewater treatment plant, and then goes down the creek back into the East Fork um, of the Trinity. So it's a water reuse project. It's one of the largest projects um, in the country, and um, it could provides up to, I believe now, 15 to 20 percent of the drinking water for people who live in these North Texas areas or these areas here. So it's an amazing project to come out and just see how it works and to see it here. Um, although it is a constructed wetland, it does look like a nature preserve. And we do get that question quite often, are you a nature preserve? And we're like, no, we're not. And we kind of explain to them what we are. But if you do come out, um, you'll see um, what the wetlands look like. So the wetland obviously does wonderful things. Um, our plants, like our pickerel weed here, um, and then you can see our, uh, our cattails here. So the plants are very important. Um, so as I mentioned, it looks like a nature preserve. Well, they built the wetland and everything came. Um, we have some beautiful uh, flowers, creatures, everything here. And I wanna go over kind of the spring wildlife that's here. You come now, everything's greening up. Um, we are a resting place for migratory birds. We are located in the central flyway. So we get a lot of species. There's several here. We get the, the spoonbills, uh, the black neck stilts, the hooded mergansers. So our bird list is over 260 species because of this being built. Um, these birds never came before until the wetland was built. Here's just some more here, just to see. It's over an overload of the different kinds of birds um, that are here. Um, our, our newest photo is this one right here. We have a, um, some great horned owl eaglets, and then we have a nesting pair of bald eagles. We have a, a couple, we have no eaglets now. They're about ready to fly the nest. Um, so they'll be leaving here in just a little bit. So lots of bird life if you're birders. Um, it also provides a nursery, the wetland does, for wildlife. So you can see we have the, the baby ducks, lots of bobcats. We have a really good population of bobcats. This is a little coyote pup that we got a picture of. And then of course our rabbits. So right now in the springtime, we have a lot of the nursery type behavior taking place um, in our wetland. I like to go over the mammals because we have pretty much every type of mammal that should be in this part of Texas. You see our raccoons there, they accidentally popped up. Uh, bobcat left in a tree, uh, mom went hunting. Here's our little coyote. I think he's so sweet looking. And then um, up a little adult there. And then our, our American minks and our river otters. With the American mink and the river otter being here, it really lets us know that we do have a healthy wetland because they prefer to have a very healthy place to go and um, uh, hang out. So that's kind of cool. I've never actually seen the river otter. I've only seen um, signs of them on our boardwalk. You will see a lot of droppings left behind. And that's usually sometimes all you'll see. But uh, 
that. And then I love putting these guys in the air because everybody always forgets about the small ones. And they're, they're beautiful, all of our insects. So we have our dragonflies, our butterflies, um, our different types of insects, even bees, right? Even flies can be pretty. I know that's kind of weird to say, but they can be um, that bright green. And then even your spiders. This, this picture, if you got a really good look at it, um, uh, the pay palps, the bluish kind of color there, they're beautiful, beautiful creatures. And so, um, and they do provide a large percent of uh, habitat or, or food source for our birds and other um, animals. So I know I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I know we're running a little behind there. So this is who we are. This is when we're open. And um, if you are one of those people who live in those North Texas cities, uh, I would encourage you to come out and visit and actually see the water source that uh, you will receive your water from. You actually walk out over it. We have a group out right now. I'm sitting in front of a big window and they're going out right now to test the water that they will be drinking. And probably we estimate nine to nine months to a year. So um, uh, come see us and there's our information. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, I appreciated the tie-in, right? When we think about conservation, it's not just for people to use, but for our, our friends in the environment too. So appreciated the tie back to that. Next up, our next speaker, we have Ms. Kim Conroe, uh, again, she's previous president for Native Plant Society, and she's going to talk about native and adaptive landscaping. Kim? Kim, you're, you're muted. Start over. Thank you. I so appreciate y'all inviting us. Uh, appreciate the North Texas Municipal Water District and Texan by Nature for hosting this conservation series. And um, gosh, field trip to the wetlands, right? John Bunker is really a water hero. Uh, it's very exciting uh, to see that. And the animal pictures made me so happy. Uh, but now to our society. And the North Native Plant Society of Texas has been around for 42 years. And our mission is to promote and conserve native plants and habitats, native habitats. And we do it through education and outreach. And almost every state in the United States has a native plant society. Uh, natives are specific, I'm gonna try to go fast through this so I might miss some things. Um, natives are specific to ecoregions and it, they evolved and they occur naturally in a region or environment. So you can uh, wonder what defines an ecoregion. So the ecoregions are defined by three major conditions. Soil, is it acidic, alkaline, clay, sandy, well-drained, does it hold water, not hold water? The rainfall, the um, average rainfall in Texas can vary from uh, east to west from 50 inches to 15 inches. And um, temperatures, are we freezing or heat? And native plants are adapted to these varying extremes. And so that's one of the reasons why we really encourage native plants because they, they're adapted to our ecoregions, they evolve there, they uh, are part of the circle of life that has, uh, for example, this little mason bee here on the red bud in my front yard. This is an early emerging bee, another reason to have native plants because they are in sync with our native animals and insects and help us to um, keep the circle of life going. And so you wanna know why do you wanna put natives in your, in your landscape? And one reason is because they will survive the extremes of temperature and rainfall. They've seen it before. And we've seen since last year, they survived snowmageddon and now they're surviving droughts. And they save water and that means more water in our reservoirs. They reduce the use of irrigation. Uh, I love to see that we're gonna have a St. Augustine that won't, won't use as much water. Thank you very much for that. But what they also do here, and is this chat? Let me get rid of that. Here we go. They, um, they slow the movement of water over surfaces. So if you reduce a lawn and you put more native plants in, you'll be slowing down that water and then the land can absorb it. So soil microbes will help to decontaminate compounds that. Uh, pesticides, herbicides, even oils and things from streets. As you saw in the wetland, native plants can do that in the soil in your yard. So, and uh, that also, so improving the water availability and improving the reservoir quality. And next. And they reduce maintenance. So as you 
put more um, native plants in your yard, you can reduce the use of lawn equipment, improving the air quality, less uh, compounds, poisons in our air, and less climate changing carbon in the air. So that's a plus. Let's see. And there's no need to apply fertilizers or pesticides. Um, and another way then that improves our water quality for reservoirs, if you're not using a lot of uh, pesticides in your yard, and please don't, they're generally broad-based and they kill most uh, insects, beneficial or not. And we really need those insects providing the ecosystem services to uh, help pollinate our plants, including agricultural products. So we don't want um, pesticides to run off into our water supplies and causing contamination issues. And um, how, gosh, that wetland was so exciting. I, that just, uh, I can't get over that, how wonderful that was. Another benefit of native plants is that they can reduce your maintenance load in the fall when, if you change your mind about what's beautiful and the benefits of, of native plants, you, you start to think that maybe it doesn't need to be all tidied up all the time. And it doesn't. If you'll, if you'll leave the leaves and leave your stems throughout the winter, leave those seed heads so uh, birds, uh, resident birds, and then spring migratory birds can use those seeds, wait until the first, after the first few warm days in March to start doing a tidy up. So it doesn't need, to, messy is good in the winter and your leaf litter is really important to uh, Lepidopterans, that's moth and butterflies and other creatures, other small insects, even lizards that live in that leaf litter. So there's really no need to rake it all up and have it be super tidy. You can rake a little bit of it up if you just have to have a tidy spot and then put it as a mulch area under some hedges or something. But as you can see here, there's a sphinx moth in the middle of that um, leaf litter there. So we want to um, honor their home. That's their home. So wildlife need native plants to survive. And then we need the ecosystem services that wildlife provides to survive. So this, uh, all these pictures were taken in my garden. There's a squirrel on a possum paw. Uh, you can see a little bees and this beautiful butterfly on a Turk's cap. Here's a spider on a sunflower. And the middle picture there are some little baby mockingbirds. Um, the fellow at the bottom there didn't quite get his mouth open in time. I, they thought my phone was a mom. So, and then here's a mockingbird again on the adult on the possum hall. And native plants give you a sense of place. Where are you? Uh, East Texas looks very different from West Texas, looks different from North Central, looks different from the coast. And part of that look is the native plants. When you look around and uh, you can drop yourself there and know where you're at because of the plants. So they provide our sense of place. And you can, the aesthetics, some people are, oh gosh, I just don't want that messy yard. Well, you don't have to have it. You can do a formal yard with, um, native plants. It's not about the plants you use, it's about the design that you use. So you can have a very formal yard with native plants, as you see here on the left picture. And then on the right picture, uh, that's my front yard. I, I do a wildscape. I decided several years ago I wasn't going to mow my front yard anymore. And, and I quit mowing. And uh, lo and behold, the wonderful seeds in the sea bank. I have a lot of milkweeds in there. And every year it's different. Different plants will, you know, will uh, be the majority and it's just a wonderful ever-changing palette. So I love it, it's very interesting. Right plants, right place. Uh, native plants can be shade specific. You can have shady, cooler, moisture areas and native plants that can uh, fit that area. That will be great for all those conditions. So, sunny, hot, dry areas. Uh, you can see here sort of like what people call the hell strip. Grow native plants in there. Uh, provide some pollen for pollinators. Some people, uh, there's a big movement now to reduce the lawn, but it is good to have some lawn area. I know it's fun to 
uh, run and play in, have croquet, volleyball games, what have you. It's a can be very uh, fun for your family. But if you want to get rid of your lawn, one place, one way to do it is to do this layering method where you use cardboard and newspaper and you slowly uh, lay that down, you scalp the lawn, lay down some two or three layers of newspaper, but not the shiny parts, just the, the parts that are not shiny. And then a layer of cardboard being sure to cover all the seams. And on top of that, add some compost and you can get yourself a great start on planting. Then what you would wanna do is cut an open hole, put your native plant in there, uh, give some space for the roots to breathe. Uh, you can add in the cardboard area, add two to three inches of mulch. And then in the open area that you're leaving for the plant to roots to breathe, maybe just an inch. So a lot of people have problems with their uh, landscapes is that they, when they put them in, they want it to be full from the beginning. And we need to consider the adult size of plants. So plan for the full size of plants. Um, and then uh, as they grow, you can see this is the same spot. They've grown and they filled in that area just beautifully. So friendly plants uh, for, if, uh, what am I trying to say? Put tall plants in the back, medium in the middle and short in the front. And so know your plant characteristics. And we have definitions here about plant categories. So um, I wanna point out this picture was taken in March of this year on March 27th. And it is a monarch butterfly uh, desperately seeking nectar. We did have a late spring this year. And this uh, insect found I hope some nectar there in the, in the dandelion. Now the dandelion is a naturalized non-native plant. We all have them and they're, they have made themselves at home all across the United States. So you have to ask yourself, are you going to worry about that or not? And personally, I wouldn't worry about it because as you can see, it is providing an ecosystem service. It's getting this poor desperate monarch some nectar when the otherwise uh, plants are, are laid. So uh, let me define these three things are important categories. A native plant is a species that has evolved and occurring naturally without uh, human intervention in an ecoregion or environment. And they are the only plants that the Native Plant Society does recommend. The non-native plant is a species that does not occur naturally in a particular region or environment. A naturalized plant is a non-native species that is growing on its own in nature. An invasive plant is a non-native species um, whose introduction is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. A lot of times people will say, oh, that plant is invasive. Well, it's actually a native plant and it's just simply aggressive because it's very happy where it's at. Plants want to reproduce. An adapted plant are introduced plants that are non-native and they are introduced to the horticulture industry. They're very hardy. They originate from areas with similar soil types, climates, and hardiness zones. And the Native Plant Society of Texas does not recommend or endorse adapted plants due to their potential to become invasive plants which can harm the environment or, or our economy. If you'd like to find lists of native plants by region, you can go to mpsot.org and we have these wonderful plants. Uh, we have uh, surely a region that will cover wherever you're at in Texas there. We also have lists of nurseries where you can find plants, a lot of expertise and information and field trips. We have programs to help you, uh, native plant certification programs, uh, garden grants, and then our nursery program. And to summarize, native plants benefit conservation. They connect us to nature through seasonal changes and a sense of place. They save and improve water quality, giving more water and cleaner water to reservoirs. They are drought tolerant and temperature extreme tolerant, and they help wildlife to thrive. Done. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. I, I really appreciated the visuals in your presentation. I've I've heard from some, I think there's often reluctance to, to go native and adapted route for fear of being the, the outlier or the eyesore in the neighborhood. And it's, it's always good to show 
some of the aesthetics that, that can be achieved through native and adaptive plants. It's really beautiful landscapes when, when done well. So we're, we are right at time. Um, I do see one question in the chat box. I will address that one real quickly and I'll, I'll ask one more question to the panelists. Um, for those that do need to go ahead and drop off, uh, again, we will be sending out the presentation uh, to those that registered and participated today. So I do encourage you to reach out to the speakers individually. If you have follow-up questions that didn't get addressed here today, um, please do reach out, please do engage with them. I know they're happy to share information and, and happy to provide assistance where they can. So uh, with that, we've got one chat question in the chat box from Mr. Grimes. This is for Chrissy or Ken. Uh, since there was talk about turf grass and native lawns, I was wondering how land managers can balance the trade-offs between turf and native plants. Um, I would say, you know, uh, lawns get a bad reputation. Lawns can provide a lot of eco services as well. We, I'm not promoting lawns over native plants. Um, lawns and native plants can coincide together and they can both be managed in a way that can both promote ecosystem services. So, you know, there's a great debate about that. And I'm not, you know, pro lawn over, over other things. Um, so they can coincide together. There's room for both, so. Oh, I think Christy's right. You just have to decide on how much lawn do you really need? And, you know, what do you want to do with your lawn? If you want to have a nice place to have a barbecue or like I said, play croquet or volleyball, that's, that's a great thing. But if you have like an area I live in, people have two and a half acres and they mow the whole thing like it's a lawn. It's just crazy when that could be a prairie. It was prairie first. Mm -hmm. So why not let it be prairie again? You know, you're not doing anything in your front yard. Nobody does anything in their front yard. You, lawns are great. Uh, in the back, I guess, I, you know, I just have really changed my attitude. I've changed my, what I see is beautiful. And I see a uh, henbit now and dandelions is beautiful in a perfectly manicured lawn is not as beautiful to me, but certainly a weedy lawn is not beautiful either. So if you're going to have it, get something like uh, Christy was describing that gorgeous St. Augustine lawn that's drought tolerant, you know, how wonderful of an improvement would that be? You know, the great things are that we do have a, a turf grass breeding program at Texas A&M and that's the number one characteristic we breed for is drought tolerance. So we're not just releasing grasses that are going to take all of the inputs. So we're really trying hard to get grasses for folks who want lawns but don't want to use all the water and all the fertilizers and stuff like that. And so, you know, like Kim said, there's a place for both. Um, there's even mixed landscapes, right? You know, you can mix certain uh, beautiful uh, perennials into lawns and, you know, have those that, that coincide together. So it's all dependent upon what you want out of your area. What's the use of your area? So. I think that's great. A common theme regardless, right? If you've got turf for native plants or mix of both is, is proper management, right? It's well, not and there are, as it's all approach. <laughs> there are native lawns too. I mean, yes. you can get um, seed mixes with uh, three different native grasses in them that will be a native lawn. That's and we do have a native turf grass in Buffalo. Yeah. Grass, so. so yay. <laughs> that's, that's great. So we've got one more question uh, coming through on the chat box. Um, and the question is from, from Mr. Peasley, what are some recommendations for management on Buffalo grass? I'd say the biggest thing is um, making sure you have proper drainage. You know, buffalo grass really thrives in areas that get less than 25 inches of rainfall, which we know here in North Texas, DFW, we usually get more than that, right? And so as long as you have well-draining soil, um, don't give it too much love. You know, right. usually, usually what I recommend for buffalo grass is um, if you could do one pound of nitrogen, per thousand, it's going to look 
drastically better if you do nothing. But if you start teetering over that one to two pounds of nitrogen, which we know we get nitrogen from, from rainfall, thunderstorms, um, returning clippings, those kind of things. Um, it just depends on what kind of look you want, you know. So just don't overmanage, but it can do well in this area as long as it's not in the shade. No shade. Right. Cannot grow in the shade. Go so. across the sedges. If you put sedges in instead of lawn in your shady areas, they look really nice. Yeah, there's and, a lot of beautiful um, sedges. That I know. I see, I walk on the prairie all the time and I see big patches of buffalo grass near the riparian areas, just on the little hillsides. Nobody cares for them. I mean, gosh, don't overwater them and don't fertilize them. They'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've got one more question coming in. And I think this, uh, Linda, you may be able to speak to it. Kim, you may have some comments as well. But the question is, I want to encourage firefly species. If I use mosquito control, either the pellets or the new Spartan uh, mosquito apparatus, will those chemicals harm the firefly population? I know it's more insect related, so if we need to defer, uh, feel free. You know, if you're using the pellets, you're putting those in water, right? And you're putting them in your little pond or your damp areas. I don't think that's going to hurt fireflies, but I'm not an entomologist, so I couldn't say. But I overmanaged lawns do tend to reduce the number of fireflies we have because they like leaf litter. That's part of where they live. So pick some spots and let it be littery leaf in the in the. <clears throat> fall and winter. What, what do you, does anybody else have any knowledge about that? Yeah, I'm yeah. not, uh, you, you, I, I like you using the pellets. I think that was a good catch there, Kim, because I think if you're just putting those in the water, I don't know the life cycle of a firefly though. I don't know if um, I would check that out too and see uh, what that life cycle is, because if they do depend on that water source, you know, that would then that would be detrimental. So, um, and where that water might drain if they do burrow um, in the soil. So that'd be something to look into as well. Yeah, I will mention, uh, you know, Dr. Seegers being with Texas A&M, AgriLac has some good resources out there on the extension mm -hmm. side, entomology side, which may be a good, um, good reference, a good resource for you for those types of questions. I've got, I've got two more, not seeing any more in the chat box. Um, I do wanna ask a quick question of, of Randall and, and Linda before we close. Um, so Linda, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, you did a great job outlining really the connections between some of our watersheds and the role wetlands play in terms of water supply, but the Bunker Sand Center um, serves as an education facility as well. And, um, I just wanted to ask if there's anything you want to highlight there on opportunities uh, for promoting conservation and, and even water quality through education, either there at the center or through collaborative opportunities. I know y'all work a lot with other organizations that have similar missions in the region. So anything you want to mention uh, there for the audience? Yeah, well, thanks, Galen. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I get something caught in my throat a minute ago. Um, yeah, so we do work with a lot of other um, organizations in promoting conservation. Um, we have a big conservation project coming up here the next couple of weeks, actually within the next couple of weeks, starting this week. If anybody's interested in that, um, we're looking um, just for general people who are interested in conservation. Um, a big project that we're working on now, and you can email me and ask me about that. Uh, we work with North Texas, of course, because they manage the wetland and they help us out with our projects here on site. Uh, and so our education piece, again, it's just a real um, important piece. And so we have high school programming this summer. So we have a lot of things happening this summer um, to help the younger generation, the high school kids to actually take a specific stance on sustainability and aquatic investigations. And so check those out on our site because I think that's kind of where it starts. That's what we're here for. And I think sometimes um, high school kids get left behind a little bit when it comes to environmental education. Um, it's really focused on the elementary. So, um, you know, if you know someone who is interested in the conservation field or sustainability, uh, check out what we have to offer this summer. It's <clears throat> great. I'll, I'll vouch for the center. It's a great facility uh, for those in the region that um, are close by. I do encourage you to, to go check it out, take advantage of it where you can. And, and for those on the call who are further away, um, yeah, please do reach out to staff. Linda and, and the staff there have always been very generous with their 
experience and expertise. Um, so you may find some benefit even if you're not um, local. So Randall, um, one final question uh, for you. You talked about some of the benefits of green infrastructure and, and you made a comment there about impacts on erosion. Um, and it got me thinking about how green infrastructure can affect hydrology. And so my, my question is, is can you, can you provide a little bit of comments about the impact of green stormwater, not just for water quality, but also on water supply? And, and what came to mind was their role in helping mitigate some of those uh, peak flow events and streams, and then the erosion that comes with it, which can you know, result in sedimentation mm -hmm. reservoirs and some of those other things. So any, any kind of tie back there to water supply um, specifically for, for green stormwater? Yeah, um, as, as we've been seeing over time, um, probably the last 20 years, our storms have become more intense, uh, meaning you know, higher rainfall, shorter time frame, and then we have you know, periods of, of drier times and drought, right? But um, those higher event rainfall, um, of course, carry a higher amount of volume. And um, what we can do, what is better is to, to um, trap that water before it gets into, let's say the, the creek basin or, or the river basin. Um, so it has more time to filter into either going into groundwater, so it's another source longer term, you know, for the native plants or, or whatever landscaping we might have around. But also then it's, it's trapped and not the volume so much is getting into that river system right away. It'll go in over time, you know, weeks or months later. So there's a, a slower me method because if, we, if it's a flash, flash event and, and, and so much volume gets into that, that creek bed and starts eroding the bed itself or the, the walls of the creek, then you're carrying all tremendous amount of sediments into our lakes as well. Right. And then the lake capacity itself is going to diminish. And then again, um, we're either going to have to spend money dredging the lakes so they had that original capacity for water supply sources or, or abandon it and move on to a different lake and such. So, um, so it has a twofold effect. One, you know, being the lake capacity itself and also replenishing our groundwater. Yeah, that great answer. And again, I think it really just speaks to the connectivity, you know, our activities and the water cycle and our watersheds, it's, it's all connected. So. Mm -hmm. We're, we're um, past time. I do want to thank those that stuck with us. Um, I do want to thank our speakers today, a bunch of great information uh, presented. Again, the presentations will be sent out and, and folks, you're more than welcome to reach out to the uh, panelists today individually and, and get information. So with that, I will uh, bring this, this webinar to a close. There will be a, a, another, this is part of a four-part series, so more information to come.